Hey, good day, it's Crazy. Welcome back to the shop today. I'm working on the Titan Glow Plug engine uh, in this episode. I'm going to be doing the cylinder head. I promised I was going to get there. <laughs> we are going to do it. And this episode has been a bit delayed because of, well, sort of reasons. And I want to show you those reasons. Uh, basically, I've had to do a lot of upgrades and improvements around the workshop. Uh, I've made some new tools and I've fitted some new things around the workshop and that sort of makes my life a bit easier and I want to show you what I've been doing. I'll show you the Titan Glow Plug engine parts first and we'll talk about those and then we'll go for a bit of a workshop tour and we'll have a look at the things that uh, I've been working on. Now in the previous episode I machined up this uh, cylinder head. Uh, it's not finished, it needs to have some through holes drilled around the top face there and that will be for the hold down bolts. Uh, we also need to machine a series of grooves which will create the cooling fins in the top of the cylinder head and there needs to be a groove machined on the underside that clears the baffle on the top of the piston. So that's what we're planning to do today. Now, in the last week or so, I actually tried it out on this part here. Now this was the casting that was supplied with the kit. And unfortunately this was scrapped because somebody had cut the gate off the casting and cut it too close to the finished size of the cylinder head. And that basically meant that I couldn't finish the diameter to the size shown in the drawings without leaving that flat there. And I went through and I decided I would try all the machining processes here. And at first glance, this looks great, except it's not. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the, the hold down bolt holes aren't aligned correctly with the grooves that create the fins. When I set this up to cut all of the grooves for the fins, I didn't have it tight enough in the fixture and it rotated and it dug out the corner of these two fins here. And also the slot on the underside isn't clocked correctly compared to the, the fins in the top of the head. So basically I made a whole bunch of rookie errors on this one here, but I think I've learned from my mistakes and we're gonna try doing this one a little bit differently. And that's the basis of today's episode. But first of all, I wanna show you the little projects that I've been working on around the workshop to make up for the fact that we're not gonna do much on this today. Well, this is the first thing that I've been working on. Now, a while ago I did an episode called Shop Made Tools and I was having a look at some accessories that I'd made around the workshop and this was one of them. Now, this is a fabric head steel socket that I can bolt to the underside corner of my welding bench. And this socket will take a number of accessories. Now, one of those was an engineer's vise that you just drop in there. You rotate the vise to suit the work that you're doing. And I also made this little mini anvil and once again, it just drops into that socket. You can tighten up that handle and you can position that anvil wherever you want it to go. Now at the time when I was working on this, I said that I was going to continue making accessories and uh, I had two in mind. One of them was a, uh, an old three-jaw chuck that I could put in there and you could tighten up round work if you wanted to grind it or weld it or whatever. And this was another one. Now this is um, made by AEG. Now, they sold these as an accessory for their range of drills and you could also turn this into a sort of a mini wood lathe. So the idea was that you could put a, an AEG drill through the socket, tighten it up, and had a rail that fitted through this hole here and that became the bed of the wood lathe. Had a matching tailstock at the other end. Now, this belonged to my father. I still actually got the other accessories that go with this, but I figured this would be perfect to go into this socket, so I welded a uh, a piece of this uh, solid stock onto a plate, screwed that on to the, the casting, which is like a die casting, and once again that goes into that socket and you can rotate that wherever you want that to go. Now what that means is that you can take any drill with a standard 43mm nose piece on it. Now just about all drills that are made today have this standard size and you can fit that through there you go. <laughs> Safety first. Now you can fit that through and then tighten that up with an, M, uh, with an 8mm hex key. And you've now got a rotary spindle. So I can put all sorts of things in here like wire wheels and uh, sanding discs and whatnot. And this runs at fairly high speed. Lock it on and you've got yourself a polishing spindle if that's what you want. So let's have another look at uh, how it works. This is one of these Scotch-Brite flat discs and you can just put that in like so. 
Alright, let's find something to polish. Okay, I think you get the idea and uh, any sort of sanding or buffing or wire wheel system that you can fit into this chuck here is perfect for this operation. And of course the other thing is that you can just simply rotate this to suit how you want to do the job. So that's one of the accessories and the reason why I only did this now is that uh, I had to get the sandblaster out to clean all the old paint off this die casting and then I had to get the powder coating unit out. Now it's not worth doing it just for one little job like this so I had a number of other jobs that were sort of half finished and I sort of let all those stockpile up until I got to the point where I could do all the sandblasting on all of the projects and then all of the powder coating. That's one reason why I've been messing around this week instead of working on the Titan engine. Okay here's the next thing. Now I decided to treat myself a while ago to buy one of these Decal clone tool and cutter grinders. Now. I had my eye on one of these quite a long time and I actually have a whole bunch of old end mills and slot drills that need sharpening. So I thought it was about time to get serious about doing that. And the other thing I really need to be able to do at home here is to sharpen my own twist drills. So this seemed like the ideal setup for doing that. Now one of the reasons why I've been busy this week is I had to clear a space for this to go. So this space here was originally taken up with a couple of plastic crates full of aluminium scrap, plastic scrap, and I decided to clear all of that and put this machine here permanently. And this toolbox at the back has all the accessories in it. Now the thing is, I already owned a Quorn tool and cutter grinder. Now they were just, I think that tool was described in the Model Engineer magazine many years ago. Uh, it's an excellently designed tool, but for me, I found it hard to use. Unfortunately, the scales on a lot of the adjustments were hard for me to read, and the locks on the tool head didn't lock up as tightly as I liked. Uh, I fiddled around with it for a long time, but I figured in the end, this thing is purpose designed, and it's quite heavy and well made, so I figured I'd get this. So that now lives there, and you might say, well, what did you do with the corn? Uh, well, good question. I'll show you. Right, well here's about one third of the corn. Now this is the grinding spindle and the integrated motor, the drive system, and uh, this can drop onto an accessory that goes in the compound side of my lathe. Now this is not finished yet, this is just a lash up to show you how it's going to work. But when this is sitting here, the center line of the spindle is almost exactly on the center line of the lathe. There is an adjustment here which allows you to raise and lower the spindle in relation to the axis of the lathe and of course you can rotate that and you've got also a movement with your compound slide and your saddle and your cross slide. So this part of the corn works great and that's what it's going to become as a full post grinder and the rest of the corn's up in my container at the moment and it may get cannibalized for other projects I don't know but for the moment that's what this is it's a tool post grinder. This is a project I worked on a while ago um, and I was able to put all my tool holders up on this rack system here and they just drop onto those bits of aluminium angle and this is an aluminium extrusion that I found down at the, uh, the local sheet metal works that was in their skip but it turned out it was just the right shape and just the right length to fit on the, the splashback on my lathe here but the only problem was all my Morse taper tooling was sitting on another shelf and it was awkward to get at and it was all bunched up and it didn't fit very neatly so I made this little uh, system of sockets here for the Morse taper tooling. So I just sort of dropped those in and they're handy and easy to get to. I also extended the base of this so that I can put my indicator holders on there and lock them down with their magnetic bases. Now once again this, this little project here needed powder coating and sandblasting so while I had all of that stuff out I went ahead and got this made and did the powder coating on that at the same time. So you get the idea, what, what I tend to do is get three or four projects that are happening all at the same time that need similar steps and I do all of those at once. Let me describe to you a problem <laughs> and then we'll look at the solution. Now this is my Colchester student lathe. This was uh, described as a round head lathe and what they mean there is that the top of this is beautifully contoured, sexy curves and all, but the only thing is there's no flat surface to put any tools. Now in later model Colchester's they put a, a flat top on the headstock with a rubber tray and you could put all your uh, micrometers and spanners and everything in that tray. 
try and do it on here and it's all going to end up on the floor. So how do you get around that? I'll show you. Well, here's my solution. Now, I was trawling through Instagram about a week ago and I saw an, a post on uh, a solution similar to this to create a sort of a tool caddy at the end of the bed of your lathe. Now, I'll put the name of the Instagram person below here and uh, if you want to go and have a look at what he's done, uh, it's, a, it's a good example of how you solve this problem. And I would sort of had this idea kicking around for quite a long time and I thought, you know what, it's about time I did this. So this caddy is made of carbon fibre. So if I lift this rubber sheet up here, you can see the carbon fibre weave underneath that. Now I've got a number of large sheets of this stuff. It's eight millimetres thick. It's insanely strong, lightweight, easy to work with. So I figured that was the ideal material. The, uh, this edge that's been screwed onto that carbon fibre sheet is stainless steel. There's a, a rubber bumper on the top of that and a sheet of rubber in the bottom and all of this clamps onto the the v here uh, this is the v that the the front of of the saddle rides on and if i take this off i'll show you how it works so the whole thing can be removed with a spanner and go the right way and it just slides off like that so there's the uh, underside of it, and I think you can see how that works. So there's a pair of arms here that have got a V cut in it to match the, the V on the bed of the lathe. There's a spacer plate and a clamp plate and a couple of six millimeter hex head screws to hold it all down. So if you do need to remove it for any reason, it's a very simple and quick process. Again, this is powder coated, uh, but sandblasted before that. So um, that's another reason why I had all these projects sort of waiting around to be done. So powder coating is great. I mean, it, it looks nice. It's easy to maintain. It doesn't corrode. So it's the ideal process for me anyway, for doing this sort of work. And all of this was machined up very quickly on the Bridgeport mill. Uh, didn't seem to take too long to get this done. So if you ever need to remove it, it's, it is quite a simple process. And it just slides back on like that. And at the moment, I can run the tailstock all the way back to the, the rear of the bed. Now also, for any reason, if you have a lapse in concentration, you decide to run the tailstock down to the end of the bed and you overshoot, uh, it'll collect the tray and stop the tailstock falling on the floor. Now, you may think that's never gonna happen, but it does. Uh, when I was teaching in high school, one of the students got a bit overzealous, ran the tailstock all the way down put the whole thing on the floor and smash this tail, uh, tailstock hand wheel and they are a nightmare to fix. <laughs> uh, cast iron, uh, it was broken into about four pieces so yeah, no fun. Anyway, that's the, uh, the tray, the tool caddy and uh, it's like I say a job that I've been wanting to do for a long time and it's done. Okay, this is the last thing I want to show you. I recently updated this camera rig that I use here in the workshop. And what I had been doing previously is I had used an old car rim that you can see here and I just uh, bolted a piece of this steel tube to the center of that rim and I had to pick it up and carry it around the workshop. But the good thing was that the rim takes up very little area on the floor of the workshop and most of the weight is down low. So unlike a tripod where you've got the legs spread out a long way, it's very difficult to trip over this. Now the difference this time is that I've got casters on this little frame here at the bottom and that yellow thing is a cast iron weightlifting weight and that sort of keeps all of the mass down fairly low with the rig. So let me put this camera on a tripod and I'll show you what I do with the top part. So with the top of the camera rig I've got a Sony Handycam mounted on a tripod head so I can you know, move that, tilt, pan, do all that sort of stuff with that. And above that, I've got a small LCD monitor, which I can use to see what I'm doing. I, I can move that anywhere I want that, pivot it and uh, bend it and do whatever I need to do there. And there's a flat panel LED light there as well, which is not brilliant, but it does enough in this workshop if I'm working close. Long shots can be a bit of a problem. This can also be tilted and moved um, to suit the job that I'm doing. And this whole assembly is mounted on a clamp. So I can actually take this clamp off this bit of tubing here and I can reposition the camera over my lathe or in the center of another bench. 
and it's just it's very very quick you just undo that clamp take the whole head off and you can put that back on again and you know you've got some range of movement with that as well now the other trick with this is that you can raise and lower this whole assembly so if I undo this lock here you can raise that lower it lock it and this whole arm can slide in and out of this little plywood attachment here so there's another lock on the back and I can loosen that and slide that arm out or back in again and what that means is that you can position the whole rig next to a bench and then slide the whole camera out over the center of the bench so all in all this is a, a much more versatile system it's a lot safer than what I had before and it's a lot quicker to move it around the workshop and like I say, this assembly here is transportable. We can take this off and reposition it anywhere else in the workshop. So that's what I've been doing. <laughs> and now it's time to get back onto the Titan engine. So let's go. Before we have a go at the cylinder head that will fit on the finished engine, I thought I'd talk about this one here and some of the things that went wrong. Now in the construction notes, it said that you could use a ball nose end mill to cut the slots that form the fins on the top of the cylinder head. And if you look carefully there, you'll see that the bottom of the slots have the half round radius. And it also said to use this little fixture to hold the part. And as you close that up, it's meant to grip on the section that fits inside the cylinder liner. Now it sort of worked, uh, but if you think about it, as you close the vise, it's always going to grip on these two corners here and it can't compress those two cor corners. So no matter how tightly you do up the vise, it doesn't really grip it all that well. And in fact, when I started the machining process, the cutter went into this groove first and it tilted the whole part sideways. Uh, I think it went that way and chewed up those two fins there. So that was a bit of a failure. Now also I did this in my little CNC milling machine and it's not a very rigid machine. Uh, the spindle's not all that good. Uh, the only way I could get it to work was to take very, very light cuts. So they were one millimeter depth of cut uh, I think it took 40 minutes to do the whole machining process. It got done, but it just took forever. And also the quality of the finish isn't all that good. So if you look carefully there, you'll see all of the steps created by each pass through that part. So I don't think that's going to be a viable alternative. Um, I scrapped the idea of doing it that way. We're going to do it now in the Bridgeport mill and we're going to use a slitting saw to cut all of these grooves. Now in the construction notes it says you can do that so that's where we're going. I've also redesigned this fixture so this is the cylinder head blank that we'll be doing today and this is the fixture. Now this is going to get gripped in a three jaw chuck and that will ensure that this slot closes up. Now this fixture is also pretty tight on the bottom side of the cylinder head so uh, there it goes, so that fits on like that. And just to ensure that when we start cutting, there's no chance that we we're able to pull that blank out of the fixture, I've got a sort of a flat headed screw that fits through where the glow plug will go. And then there's a plate on the back and a washer and a nut. So this is just a bit of insurance, just to make sure that when we start cutting, this all stays as one single unit. So let's get this set up in the mill and have a look at how that's going to work. This is the setup that I'll be using for holding the cylinder head and cutting the slots. So I've got a three jaw chuck bolted to a large angle plate. Angle plate is aligned with the Y axis and I've uh, already offset from the bottom of the cylinder head blank to the height of my first cut. So I'm going to be using the micrometer dial on the z-axis and the DRO and I've got a drawing here showing all the offsets from the bottom of that cylinder head blank. So as long as I stick to these numbers and run each pass it should be correct. But as you can imagine if you get this wrong the thickness of the first and last fin will be different and it's going to look stupid. <laughs> so um, in a state of high anxiety I've been through this and rehearsed it a number of times all we can do is hope that uh, both the DRO and the micrometer dial do their job. So I'm going to crank this chuck up as tight as I can get it. And hopefully that's gripped really securely.
Oh, that's the first one done, so it's pretty much just rinse and repeat and just follow the numbers. Hopefully we'll get there. Well, with uh, two cameras in the way, it was really hard to see how close I was getting that. But what we'll do now is take the whole chuck off the angle plate and the chuck's going to go over onto the little CNC mill. We're going to do all the drilling and counterboring over there. Right, I've had a chance to have a close look at this and I'm pretty happy with it. The first and last fin are within about 0 0.02 of a millimetre difference. And just either side of this counterbore where the glow plug goes, uh, the fins didn't quite break through, so I'm quite happy with that. This is going to need a lot of deburring though. And before we put this on the CNC mill, I'm going to drill the crankcase. The reason I want to do the crankcase before I do the cylinder head is that I already had the vise on the machine that's trammed in, and it makes sense to do this operation now. The other two parts, the cylinder head and the cooling fins and liner, will be done in the same chuck on the machine. So I might as well do this now. Once we get the spindle over the very centre of this bore, I can set up the G-code and drill the three holes. And we get those tapped, and then we can swap out the setup and put the chuck back on the machine. So I've already trammed in the top of the crankcase to make sure that's level with the table. So we'll go ahead now and find the centre of the bore. Okay, well that's centered on the bore now, X and Y zero. So we can go ahead and get the G-code set up and drill the three holes in this part. There are six holes in total in the cylinder head, but only three of them go all the way down to the crankcase. Got my G-code set up, we're gonna spot drill the three locations now, and then we'll drill number 36 and tap while we've got this part in the vise and it's all oriented. I'm just drilling that manually, um, advancing the tool bit, using the quill. Uh, just feel a lot happier about doing it that way, you get a better feel for it. Okay, I'll finish these off out of the vise. Because of the way I had this set up on the big angle plate in the bridge port, I couldn't bolt this uh, chuck down using the two slots parallel to the slots in the table because I had to align these cooling thin slots with the y-axis on the mill. So what I've done is I just bolted down with one bolt and then I swept the indicator backwards and forwards along this piece of brass stock here and then I tapped it in until I got it accurate. So I think I've got that pretty close. So that's all bolted down now and what we need to do now is find the center of that part and set that as the origin and then we go ahead and do all the, the drilling and the counterboring in the head. To center this part, I've had to sweep an indicator around this section of the head here. My probe won't really work in this situation. It's all burrs on the inside of this bore and it needs to touch off on the top and then move down to get the outside of that part. And I'm just worried about the burrs interfering with that. So 
did it the old school way. Uh, I think I've got that spot on. So I've zeroed the uh, X and Y there. We can go ahead now and start doing the machining. Alright, that sounded a bit funky when it was cutting through the fins, but it smoothed out when it got into the solid metal underneath. Now we've got a drill. Off camera I did each hole with a spot drill, so now we can drill right through this to number 28, and it'll go down into the fixture uh, past the bottom of the cylinder head flange. Okay, apart from deburring, that's the top of the head finish, so I'll get it out of the chuck and then we'll do the cylinder liner, or at least the cooling fins on the cylinder liner. Alright, a lot of deburring to do. <laughs> Just about ready to drill the holes in the cooling fins uh, that are attached to the cylinder liner and I've got to be really careful that I've clocked this part correctly so that the slots for the inlet port and exhaust port will be aligned correctly when it goes into the crankcase. So all I've done here is I've put a quarter inch end mill across the inlet port slot and I've used my engineer's square against the back of the column of the mill and I've aligned that uh, end mill that way. So it's not really really precise, it would be better to actually indicate that, uh, that piece of rod there but for what we're doing this is fine, uh, it doesn't have to be that precise. So I'm going to carefully tighten up the chuck now, you don't want to distort that liner. We're really just drilling holes and I'll leave that end mill in that slot so that'll give it some resistance to pushing down inside the jaws of the chuck. Or well, should stop it actually. <laughs> what are we talking about, resistance? No, it'll stop it. Just to be sure, I've re-centered that part on the spindle and set uh, X and Y to zero. And I've got to drill six holes in this part, but three of them are through holes that go all the way through to the bottom of the, the lowest fin. And the other three are tapped holes that only go a quarter of an inch deep. And they will hold the cylinder head onto the cooling fins. And then the other three holes will go right through and hold the liner onto the crankcase. So I just marked this with a sharpie so I don't make any stupid errors and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll center drill all six positions and then we've got to change uh, to two different size drill bits to finish off. Alright again I'm just going to run this down using the quill manually but I'll position over each hole center using the g-code. Okay, we'll swap out to our tapping size now and drill the three holes that need to be tapped. Just going to have to talk over the rain here, but this next drill bit is a brand new bit. It's a cobalt bit and it's got a split point and I bought this specially for doing the other three holes. Now these holes have to go right through all the fins and we've got to be really careful that the drill bit doesn't wander off on the way through. So I'm hoping that this will give us the best chance of getting this uh, hole to line up. The biggest issue is that if it deflects inwards it's going to rub against the side of the, uh, the bottom of the grooves. It's going to look untidy and it may not line up with the holes in the crankcase.
Now I'm just going to tap the three holes um, that will hold the cylinder head down, but I'll do that off camera. Okay, I nearly finished for the afternoon, but I thought you'd want to see this before I pack up. Now I've done a partial deeper on the top of the cylinder head and I've cleaned up this outside surface here. I actually put this back in a four jaw chuck, I dialed it in and took a very, very fine skim cut over that outside surface to remove all those nasty burrs that were there. I put two of the screws that go all the way through into the crankcase in there and they line up, so that's good. But this is the thing that I wanted you to see and the thing I was worried about. Now right at the very bottom of the grooves that form the cooling fins, there's a line which was caused by the drill bit skimming that surface as it went through. And I was you know, really worried that that was going to cause the drill bit to deflect. But as it's turned out, it hasn't done that. But it's a bit of an eyesore. And then afterwards I realised that it really doesn't matter because when the screw goes in there, it hides that and you don't see it. So I'm able to tighten up all three of those screws and it clamps everything down nice and uh, accurately. So that's a good thing. And tomorrow I'm going to do the remaining operation in the cylinder head, which is to cut the groove to clear the piston baffle. And that's going to be a lot easier now that I've got these grooves done. I've got something that I can use as a reference when I turn this over to do that operation. So right now I'm going to wash my hands, get upstairs and have some refreshment. Happy days. Okay, well I was able to do some more work on the cylinder head this morning. Uh, the first job that needed to be done was to machine this groove in the underside of the cylinder head. Now this clears the baffle on the top of the piston when it comes up to the top of the combustion chamber. And in order to make sure that the cooling fin slots were aligned with that groove, I put a piece of 1 8 inch ground rod in one of the gaps between two cooling fins. And I bolted this all down to a small fixture plate in the milling machine and I was able to sweep that piece of brown steel rod with an indicator to make sure that I had everything aligned correctly with the Y axis of the mill. Then after that I was just able to sweep the outside of the projection that goes inside the liner, get that aligned with the spindle of the mill, then offset the correct distance and machine that slot. And that was just done with a 1 8 inch ball nose end mill. So a bit of deburring and that part's finished and the other job I did this morning was I made the keyway in the prop driver. So you can see that quite clearly there and that engages on a pin that's fit, fitted to the crankshaft. So that's just a 1 8 inch uh, steel pin, goes into a drilled hole in the end of the crankshaft and that is what gives the positive drive to the propeller. So for all those people who were worried about that, I just hadn't got that job done at the, the last video. So what I can do now is um, I can do a partial assembly now. I've made a 3D printed uh, connecting rod and a 3D printed piston. So I wanted to be able to rehearse how this whole thing goes together because it's not immediately obvious how you do the assembly. And uh, once, the, once the liner goes on, of course you can't get at the connecting rod or the piston. But it does go together, so I'm happy with that. And I can now assemble uh, this like that. And the cylinder head goes on with the slot for the baffle on that side. And I can put all of the screws in. I've already done this. It all goes together. It's very tight though. Come on. There it goes. And I can put all of the cap head screws in there and they'll all bolt down nice and tight. So uh, what's coming up? Well, we have to do the actual connecting rod and the actual piston. And we need to do some work at the front end of the engine here. So I've got to drill and bore for the venturi, make the venturi, and we've got to make the spray bar and the needle valve. So I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe another four weeks and then we should have this thing at the point where it might run. So, are we getting close? Well, yes, I think we are actually getting close and uh, I had misgivings about this whole project when I got started, but as things have moved on, it's actually worked out better than I expected. So how do I feel? Like, 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 like a boss. Okay, well that's it for me. I'll see you on the next video, guys. Thanks for watching and Prezzo, signing out. See ya.